Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I see some familiar names and faces on the screen, and it's great to see some of you again. Uh, for some of you, this is, uh, I see names I, I don't recognize and are, are probably brand new, so uh, welcome. My name is Jordan Abney. I'm the Executive Director for BC School Sports. And the idea today is that uh, we know after 17 months of, of really no school sport that We've had a, a, the volume of inquiries just about things have, have been very high and everybody's trying to feel their way back through these first couple of weeks. So we thought it'd be good for both new and experienced ADs to, to take a couple of minutes to kind of refresh themselves, get a bit of an update on BC School Sports, just kind of jog the memory a bit on core policies, talk a little bit about the COVID related uh, tweaks that have been made to policies and just have a chance for people to ask questions directly uh, and just do a quick little, you know, uh, relearn, I guess, or learn about what's happening with BC School Sports and hopefully kind of get everybody uh, back kind of rolling smoothly again before, before the first deadlines and things kind of get really uh, moving. So we have been, this is the third and final one of these. Um, they're all the same, so you haven't missed anything, but uh, hopefully it'll be a little bit more polished for you and we'll kind of get you out of here in, in reasonable time. I know many of you are on a pro day today, so hopefully you're uh, comfortable and have had a, a little bit of a quieter day. So we will get going here. Just going to quickly introduce uh, staff members. Um, so actually we need to update this uh, slide because we actually have one new staff that had just joined us this week so um many of you will know uh karen and karen is on the call karen if you want to wave hi everybody that's karen um, she's our manager of member services. She's been here for a little over six years now, uh, and it's just wonderful. She helps schools, um, all sorts of questions, STARS expert, uh, handles the eligibility process in terms of facilitating back and forth between the eligibility officers or appeals, uh, and generally just keeps the place running. So uh, that's Karen. Uh, you'll see Darren and Julie there are in bold, and uh, they are our two new hires this, uh, this summer. Um, we're finally back to sort of a full strength staff complement after scaling down uh, for the pandemic. So Darren, um, Darren was on the call earlier this week, so I don't think he's with us right now, but Darren is one of the managers of sport uh, and comes to us uh, from a high performance coaching background as well as a sport administration background, primarily in volleyball, uh, but also has uh, raced triathlon and done some other, um, done some running and, and ultra running. Uh, and so we're thrilled to have him here. Uh, Julie, I think Julie is on the call. Julie Stevens, um, I'm not sure Julie, if you have your camera and mic available, you can always just pop on and say hi quickly. Julie is the other new manager of sport. Uh, Julie comes to us with an extensive coaching background and sport administration leadership background with rowing. Uh, and so, and she actually has recently worked in the uh, MLA's office for one of the MLA's in Delta, or sorry, the MP's office in Delta. Uh, so she's got uh, a, a diverse background. And both of them have been here for about three or four weeks now. Um, maybe you actually know it, maybe five or six weeks and they're settling in and doing a great job. So, uh, and then lastly, uh, we have just um, hired uh, Prub and Prub, I, I don't want to butcher your last name, but I believe it's Jahal, and feel free to correct me. Uh, and she's our new administrative assistant and really has just started this week. So um, she's only in day three today, and uh, I believe she is on the call as well. So if you see some names, just it's good to know kind of who's in the office. Uh, what we will do now that we've kind of got staffing settled is we'll put out something in the next couple of weeks with a breakdown of who to speak to um, around different issues. So you kind of have a, an idea of who to, who to look for when you need some support. So that's us. Moving on. One of the things that we did uh, over the last couple of months is, you know, our logo has, and sort of branding has been quite weak. We've used a bunch of different logos sort of without a lot of reason or, or consistency um, or going back, you know, 10, 15 years. And so we said, let's, let's get this straight and create something that you know, uh, helps create some brand identity as well as uh, our schools will, you know, be able to use and, and proudly display amongst their schools or jerseys, whatever they want to, to use it with. Um, don't forget that this is your organization as member schools. And so um, this is really the, the provincial representation of us as a collective. And so we, we it's not a full rebrand because obviously the metal and the flame has been longstanding use off and on. And so we wanted to kind of hone in on that and create a bit more of a cleaner and, and fresher look. And so um, hopefully, you know, nothing significant, but just wanted to bring your attention to that and, and just make sure you're aware. And if you do want the assets um, to use in the capacity, just let us know and we can send those to you. So moving on to the AD uh, 
piece of the puzzle here. So just talk a little bit about the role of the athletic director um, and from the different perspectives. Obviously there's, there's duties from a BC school sports perspective, from a school perspective, dealing with parents and stakeholders, and then you know, your local association and zone as well. So starting with the BCSS piece, the athletic director really is the primary point of contact for that school and its athletic department with BCSS. And so in probably 90 to 95% of cases, if there's a question, we will reach out to you first. Occasionally we will, if it's really sports specific or something related to a roster, we may just say, hey, to the coach, or if it's something more school-based, uh, obviously the administrator may be brought into the conversation, but like I said, 90 plus percent of the time, it is uh, the athletic director that provides that uh, point of contact between BC school sports and the go between uh, with the school. Okay. Uh, other key duties that uh, kind of fall in there is obviously the athlete and team registration. So working through the star system and we'll, we'll have a quick kind of refresher on stars here in a little bit. Um, but your job as the AD is to make sure that your teams and students and student athletes are registered into the system on the appropriate teams by the appropriate dates uh, to make sure that you know they are eligible to compete um, when they need to be. Uh, and so, obviously, you know some athletic directors have uh, admin support from their from their office. Some have uh, students that come in and help with you know um, different pieces of it. Uh, all of that is is well and good, and however you choose to do it. Um, but at, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's usually your responsibility to make sure that gets done correctly. So just be aware of that. Next is the eligibility and transfers. So, you know, tied into that whole um, the piece about registration is to make sure that students are eligible. And so whenever there's an eligibility, uh, and, and again, we'll go through the policies here in a bit, but just the AD is usually the point person that works between, you know, the coach, the student athlete, the family and administration to make sure that you know, these students are eligible or working towards eligibility and being part of that process, um, making sure that your students meet those eligibility requirements. And then anytime there's a student that's leaving or coming to your school, there's usually a transfer that's involved. And then again, you'll sort of steward that process, making sure that BCSS has the right information. In most cases, it's not too cumbersome, but then obviously if you get into eligibility applications and appeals, then there's a bit more work that goes with that. But again, we'll touch on that. Another key role of the AD that often is overlooked is, is sort of that contribution back to, to BC School Sports. And I, and I get that, you know, time is precious and the demands and the job are, are plenty and the support is often minimal to none. Uh, but, you know, as much as possible, you know, again, this is your organization and not you as athletic directors but of the schools. And so, you know, it's important to have, whether it be committees, working groups, CI AAA, um, those types of things, you know, making sure that you're contributing back in, in that way to make sure that both your school and school sport as a whole are, are continuing to thrive and grow. And then lastly, uh, championships. And again, we'll talk in more detail later about championships, but um, just considering your role uh, and your school's role as a potential championship host at some point, um, if it's not in the next year or two, in the next two to three or three to four years, you know, when that makes sense and, and what sport, but our championships are, are obviously, you know, celebrations of school sport and, and sort of the highest experience our kids can get um, in, in school sport. And it's really important that we share that responsibility uh, across our schools to make sure that we're providing those great opportunities and, and wonderful memories for kids through our, host, our championship hosting. Moving on uh, to the school side, you know, obviously the one that comes probably first and foremost is recruiting, onboarding, educating, and supervising coaches. Um, we know that you know, more and more coaches are coming from outside of the school, which just makes this tougher and tougher, uh, but also makes it more and more important to make sure you're educating and training coaches in terms of what's required, not just administratively, but behaviorally, even from a leadership standpoint, which ties into the next one, which is sort of establishing that athletics culture and expectations. And that's, you know, of student athletes, that's of uh, coaches, that's of even your admin. Uh, I, was, uh, I was talking to another AD um, couple weeks ago and he said yeah I, I met with my admin and say this is what I expect of you um, in terms of supporting me and, and that type of thing and it was a very good conversation so you know as the athletic director you are really the one that I would suggest you meet with your admin and say hey what type of culture do we want how do we want to make this look and feel and and, and you know act as, as an organization uh, and you work to make sure that culture is built from top to bottom throughout that athletics program on the administrative side scheduling uh, you know, teams and schedules, officials, transportation, all the sort of nuts and bolts that make it happen. 
uh, is usually you know uh, the responsibility of the athletic director. Again, you may be able to delegate or semi-delegate some of these things depending on your situation, but ultimately, usually it kind of falls back on the AD to make sure it's done. Uh, communicate, educate, and work with the school admin. Obviously, that's a big piece of it. I always say, anytime I get a chance to talk to principals, I say, you know, it's, it's really essential that you meet, you know, at least once a season. I prefer kind of once a month with your AD and have a set time where it's it's not just sort of a 30 second cruise to the gym. How are you? But there's a set time to talk about, you know, what are the challenges of the program? What are some of the opportunities? You know, there's teams, coaches, and so that they're aware of what's happening. School sport is the most uh, public facing uh, entity of any school it's out there every single day it's probably one of the most high costs it's probably one of the most high risk uh, and it's most public and so it's important for our ad's to recognize that and make sure their admin, admin recognize that as well in terms of having that constant communication and, and that relationship back and forth um, facility maintenance and equipment inventory. Uh, so obviously there's equipment required to run various sports, uh, whether that be volleyball nets or basketballs or whatever it might be. Uh, also from a maintenance schedule, you know, you you look around your gym and you are the one that's there the most, you know, when the bleachers aren't opening and closing properly, that might need somebody from the district to come in and, and work on that. Uh, I, I know many districts discourage, you know, staff from getting a wrench out and doing things themselves. I do know that. That does happen with ADs when it needs to. Uh, but even things like, hey, our floor hasn't been resurfaced in about 10 years. It's getting pretty bad. I need to talk to my admin about getting it on the capital project list for the district so it gets it sort of gets the attention because it needs to be done in the next couple of years or whatever, those types of things. Um, so just being aware of that. So you, know, you are the eyes and ears of your building when it comes to making sure those things are happening properly. So it's just a good to sort of keep your inventories current keep an eye on you know various capital pieces that might need to uh, have some attention and, and keep that facility running the way it should uh, safely. Uh, and then last one, sponsorship and support for the athletic program. Different schools have different approaches to this. Um, some it's very school-based, some it's very team-based, some it's very athletic program-based. Um, whatever works for you in your school, but um, often the AD will play a role in trying to generate some additional income for the athletic program um, through other, whether it be small businesses or other local partners they may have in proximity. So that's on the school side. So between BCSS and school, there's, there's hardly anything to do, as you can tell. It's hard to believe um, that you guys you know, don't have enough time to get all this done with no support. Uh, clearly, I'm being facetious when I say that. Uh, from the local association zone perspective, again, it's being aware of what's happening in your zone, contributing to, you know, hey, I'm in a schedule you know, girls volleyball this year, or a zone representatives, we need uh, somebody to help coordinate the zone track meet, and I'm a track guy, I can help with that. Just being, again, aware, there's so many different levels of school sport and, and the pieces that are required to make it happen. So just make sure that you're sort of aware of where you could have a role in those things. And then lastly, with parents and stakeholders, you know, parent meetings and, and coordinating communications with parents, making sure that your coaches are dealing with parents properly, training your coaches to deal with parents properly, all part of the equation. And I generally say, you know, a parent's meeting where you clearly lay out the culture of the program, the expectations of the students of the program, the expectations of the parents to the program, what they can expect in terms of playing time and costs and so forth, that meeting is worth its weight in gold uh, in terms of preventing any possible issues that may uh, arise. And again, that's a meeting where you, you know, it would be great to have uh, some admin at where, you know, I know some schools do it by sport, some do it so they might have all their volleyball teams together or they might do it by season of play, but having that coordination with the parents and having an act and now virtually it's much easier to do um, but having that connection where you set the expectations very clearly is is very beneficial um, for ad's and is a key part of that role and, and then also dealing with uh, parents when they when they may have a problem or a concern regarding you know a coach or a situation that has uh, arisen so Anyways, that is a very high level sort of synopsis. None of those things are, are small or easy. Um, I don't mean to, to sort of just rattle them off like that's that's not something, uh, it's a massive job for anybody. Um, and so I, I appreciate the work that all of you do, but hopefully that just sort of prompts you to think about things a little bit in terms of, am, am I kind of taking this role on in, in the way that needs to be uh, for the best for the school and for those student athletes. So moving forward, 
CIAAA, I uh, am going to introduce uh, Shannon here. So Shannon, many of you have been around a couple of years will remember Shannon when she was Shannon Key in our office. Uh, she is uh, married now, so it's Shannon Clausen, and she is now the executive director. I didn't spell executive correctly, uh, but she's the executive director for the CIAAA, and she's just going to go through for you know, five minutes, just basically as a member, uh, as an AD, at a BCSS member school, you are automatically a member of the CAAA. So it's a real great resource for ADs and we think it's really critical in providing that support for them. So she's just gonna quickly kind of walk you through what they do and how to leverage the things that you now have access to. So Jenna, I'll turn it over to you here. Thank you. Okay, just gonna share my screen here and we'll get going. Okay, so Welcome everybody. Uh, I recognize some names here uh, and also see some new faces, which is wonderful. Um, again, I am Shannon Clausen, the executive director of the CIAAA. I am located in BC still, so I will work occasionally out of the BC School Sports Office. So you may see me around otherwise as well. So I'm just gonna take you through a bit of a kind of brief overview of the CIAAA, what it is and what it can do for you as an athletic director. So what is the CIAAA? Many of you, if you've been around for a while or a brand new or a brand new athletic director, you may see this acronym or a logo and have no idea what it is. So we are the Canadian Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association. So what we are is a nonprofit organization that provides professional development, support, resources, course, courses, workshops, and advocacy for athletic directors across Canada. So we have currently, um, BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan are all members of ours. So all of the athletic directors with, within those high school sport associations receive a membership to the CIAAA. Um, our goal is really to support schools and athletic directors to build positive environments um, for athletes and, and students that don't participate in sports. So we're really here to kind of provide you tools and resources to kind of help your school and athletic or athletic department succeed. So what does the CIAAA do? We do a couple different things. So first thing we run leadership training program courses. So these courses are three hours online or four hours in person. They are courses that are specific to school sport in your athletic department. They are developed by athletic directors for athletic directors. So an example of some of our courses, uh, one of them we have is kind of creating your athletic handbook. So it will take you through all the steps and actually allow you to work and create your athletic department handbook within the course. Um, we have another course called Student Leadership Development. So it works with you and teaches you tools to help your students in your athletic department um, be leaders and, and get other students involved in sports and kind of uh, champions your athletic department. We also have courses about uh, legal issues that athletic directors may face or may not know that uh, they need to be aware of. So our courses, we have 18 of them currently. There is two in development. Um, so we continue to develop courses and they continue to roll out um, throughout the year. We also have workshops. So our workshops are a lot shorter. They're 60 minutes um, and they're more of a condensed focused session. So it could be building your strategic plan or ways to recognize and celebrate your athletics department. Um, we have probably 40, 40 plus workshops to choose from. The nice thing about these workshops is they are free to members. So all of you receive a CIAAA membership as being a BCSS athletic director. These workshops are free. So we can offer them at any time, um, maybe during a zone meeting or on a professional development day. Um, happy to offer them whenever it works for you and is convenient for you. Um, finally, we host our National Athletic Directors Conference. So this conference uh, moves across the country every year. It's a great place to meet fellow athletic directors, network, chat, take courses. There's keynote speakers, um, social events. It's a great time. Um, definitely something to mark on your calendar uh, as an athletic director to attend each year. So the CIAAA also has a resource bank and discussion for so this resource bank is available to athletic directors 24 seven whenever you need it. Um, it houses things such as what Jordan was talking about earlier. Um, we have a new uh, a parent meeting template. So we have kind of templates or we have form um, suggestions or ideas. There's coaching specific resources that you can pass along to your coaches, um, budget templates, really anything is you as an athletic director needs can be found in that resource bank. We're really looking to help save you time and provide you with the, the information and uh, content you need. 
Uh, we also have a discussion forum. So this discussion was brand new, launched in April last year. So it's really a space for athletic directors to ask questions, chat, network, share documents, um, find tournaments. Really, it's a place for athletic directors to chat and network with their fellow counterparts across the country. So if you're, you're, you're struggling to find an answer, it's a great place to post that question. We do have a committee that monitors the discussion forum as well to ensure that those questions are being answered, but uh, it's a great place to start if you're, if you're struggling in an area. Finally, we have a certification program, um, which is a three level, level certification program um, that basically helps you as an athletic director complete some professional development, learn and further yourself. Um, finally, we have all of our leadership training courses um, are prerequisites to a master's degree. So if you're interested in athletic administration, um, furthering your, your education, if you complete our leadership training program courses, they do lead to a master's degree in athletic administration through Grace College, which is recognized in BC for salary purposes. So moving forward, so as I mentioned, um, all of you will receive a, a free CIAAA membership as you are a BCSS athletic director. So this membership allows you to get discounts and promo codes on our courses and conferences. As a BC athletic director, your first course is free. So reach out to me, we, I can pass along coupon codes and discounts. It will allow you to host free workshops, um, get access to that resource bank and discussion forum. You'll be able to receive preferred uh, discounts from the CIAAA partners with us, such as Sport Factor, which is an equipment company. Um, you'll also be able to receive up-to-date information, course scheduling, our monthly newsletter, and everything um, in between. Finally, the only uh, caveat with that membership is we have to ask you to activate it. So the next step um, basically is going to be activating that membership. So how you'll activate it is you'll simply go to our website, ciaa.ca, select that login sign, in, sign up button, select memberships. You're gonna click the button that says renew or buy for myself, depending if you've been a member before, enter your information. And then to receive that free membership, you're gonna enter the coupon code that's listed there and in the circle, hashtag BCSS2122 and check out, and then you will be well on your way. I will share these instructions as well as a video in the chat following uh, the presentation, just to help you on your way. So moving forward, as I mentioned, the National Conference. So in 2020, the National Conference was set to be in Vancouver, but of course, COVID hit. Um, it was canceled for that year. Last year, we hosted a virtual conference um, due to the pandemic as well. Um, this year, we're still in the midst of deciding if it's going to be virtual or in person. Um, if we are in person, it will be in Vancouver at the Coast Coal Harbor. Um, this information, once we have a decision, will come out shortly. But either way, save the date, April 21st to 23rd, 2022, um, for an online or in-person conference. Um, we have some great speakers lined up, always looking to uh, add content and, and help athletic directors learn and grow. It's a great opportunity uh, that you will want to take advantage of. Moving in just a little bit more about that resource bank and discussion forum. So new this year, the resource bank over the summer went through a bit of a facelift. Um, there's a new section added that is in, uh, a new section called new athletic directors. So if you are new to your role or within the first couple of years, this section is going to be really useful for you. It's got a lot of kind of starting out templates, um, including budgets or parent meetings, um, as well as some examples of forms that you may need your students to fill out. So if you're looking something for something, take a look there. Um, it's going to help you kind of get started and on your way as an athletic director. The AD discussion forum. So it's a great place to network outside of the conference, connect with colleagues across the country. Um, once you're in that discussion forum, it's a great opportunity to share contact information, build connections. We're working on some ideas of maybe getting groups of athletic directors of similar size schools, maybe female athletic directors, urban athletic directors together to chat once every few months as well and be able to share and share and network as well. So great opportunity to take advantage of that discussion forum as well. So moving in just a brief kind of overview of our certification program. So we have a three level certification program. Um, within this program, basically, you will take leadership training program courses, you will receive professional development points for hosting tournaments and, and giving back to school sport. So take a look on our website for an in-depth kind of look of what uh, the certification program is. Um, we've had more and more athletic directors take part each year, which is also going to help kind of 
help us advocate on, on your behalf to, to school districts and principals and administration. So great thing to take advantage of, check it out. Um, if you have any questions, as always reach out, I'm happy to kind of work with you and help you through that program. And into our master's degree. So again, master's degree in athletic administration through Grace College. So it's a fully online master's program. So how it works is every two LTP or leadership training program courses you take through the CIAAA lead as prerequisites into a Grace College course. Now the Grace College courses are all project-based. So for example, if you are an athletic director who needs to build a strategic plan for your athletic department, you would be able to build that strategic plan as your, as your project and submit it to Grace College. So really, in a sense, you're kind of helping do the work for your job in athletic department, as well as receiving credit for it for the master's program. We've seen some great projects come out of it. Um, we've seen risk assessment plans. We've seen tournament guides. Really, anything that you need in your program, you can build into this master's degree. So it's a great opportunity for you to kind of build and learn, as well as give back to your program. Um, as I mentioned before, it is recognized in BC for salary purposes, so that's always a bonus as well. So moving on, kind of just to end, what next? What's, what should you be doing next? First step is to activate your membership. So again, I'll throw the, the chat in the chat, the uh, activation code, as well as a short snippet video to take you through how to activate. Um, after you've activated, check out and download resources from the resource bank. If there's a resource there that you um, can't find or are interested in, let me know and we can get something in there for you as there's probably other athletic directors that are looking for the same thing. Next thing, get a discussion forum login, reach out to me, I'll get you set up on the forum and, and you can start to chat and network with your fellow athletic directors. Our, uh, our fall webinar schedule has been posted this week on our website, it will go out, um, you all will receive that information in a newsletter in October as well, but we have five great courses that are happening take advantage of those and, and start your learning journey. And finally, follow us on social media. We've got some neat promos happening this year with AD tips of the week, um, information on promos from our partner Sport Factor. Follow us on social media, keep up to date with what's happening uh, in the CIAAA. And finally, here is my contact information. Feel free to reach out anytime. I'm happy to answer questions and help you along um, as, it, as you kind of start or continue your journey as an athletic director. <laughs> So with that, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them and I'll turn it back over to Jordan. Sorry, it took me a second to find the unmute button. I was behind a couple of screens. Um, where is, there we go. Okay. Let's get this back up and running here. It's always awkward when you gotta go back and forth presenters. Okay. That. So what I am going to do is I'm going to share this. I'm going to talk a little bit now about the BCSS website. So I think now you can see that. So for anyone, hopefully you're all aware, but uh, bcschoolsports.ca is our website. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the handbook and calendar, and then uh, Karen's going to speak a little bit about some of the other resources and uh, forums sanctioning that type of thing that uh, you will need to know where that resides um, on our website. So uh, you can go through this on your own screen or you can just kind of follow along here. Handbook. So this is the BC School Sports um, homepage. A little trick for you, the logo up here, no matter where you are on the website, you can just click the logo to bring you back to the homepage. Um, so that's just a good little trick. Uh, if you go to the resources, this is sort of the main navigation bar, most of you'll know. If you go to the resources tab, here's a bunch of different resources. The most common one is the handbook and calendar. That's where you will uh, do most of your looking. The handbook right here at the top, okay? So this handbook opens up a digital version of, of the BCSS handbook that you all received. Couple of reminders on this. If there's any, and ugh, if there's ever any changes throughout the year to the handbook, they will always be made in the online version. So the online version as it states in policy is always the official version. Of course, if we make changes, we will also send it out. We, just, we won't ask you to sort of comb through it looking for the, the small change. We'll let you know. But um, if you're ever sort of in that situation, the handbook is online, it is easily found and it is the official version. Um, and we will update it from time to time throughout the year when required. 
Um, I'm not sure why it loaded like that, because that's supposed to not look like that. Anyways, the table of contents, hopefully it looks better for you. I don't know why I did this this time. Uh, but the table of contents here, thing about the table of contents is if you're navigating this, say on your phone and you don't want to scroll through 94 pages, uh, this is clickable. So if you just kind of click that, it'll take you right to that section. Okay, so this loaded a little bit funny in this time, but it is there, I promise you. Let's try this again. There we go. This is how it should look. So yeah, if I'm looking for something and I want to know something about, hey, code of ethics, click on that and it'll take you right to that section. Okay. So that's the BCS's handbook. Uh, just be aware that it is there. That is always the official version. Very easy to, to have access to if you, if you are ever in a situation where you don't have your hard copy with you. Uh, the annual calendar, just a quick link. If you want to print out some others, um, for your coaches or whatever, the, the wall calendar is there. Of course, just obviously um, if dates change, which we try not to do too often, uh, but from time to time it does happen that it, it, this may change a little bit. And so, and then the other one is, and I'm gonna talk about before handing it over to Karen, is uh, up here in the calendar. So if you click on the calendar tab, it brings you to, to this page here, which is actually a, a live calendar that um, does get updated and will be updated uh, it has things like uh, deadlines. So you can see here that your membership fees uh, are due uh, on a September 30th. Um, you got eligibility submissions, different meetings. And if we go to a month that has championships, it will also, so you have in yellow, you have the dates for the championships. And so you can kind of click on them and there will be additional information you know, added to those as well. So this is a good, again, another resource what the best part about this is the two things this is not the best part but you can also filter so if you don't want to see everything you can just see certain things so use the filter but more importantly uh here you can actually add this calendar to your outlook or to your google calendar what those are what most people use um, by clicking this it'll just add it as an additional calendar which you can just click on and off so if you want to kind of see have reminders of those dates and just have them in your calendar without having to add all of them click on the add to Outlook, you'll take the, the link there, put it into your Outlook and then it will add that calendar. And then it will just automatically, any updates that we do, it will pull right to there and you'll see the calendar, the BCSS, BCSS calendar uh, in live time um, as any changes or anything, anything's get added to it. So that just kind of keeps you uh, up to date on the BC School of Sports side. With that, I am going to turn over to Karen, who's gonna talk a little bit more about some of the other resources, forms and, and sanctioning. Thanks, Jordan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be back. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through some of the other important pages um, on the website. So we'll start at the top of the page. Um, up at the very top, there's a contact uh, contact button here. So if we're clicking on the contact button, it's going to bring up a menu on the left hand side. You'll see contacts for athletic associations, staff members, uh, board of directors, um, zone presidents, and so forth. So if you're ever looking for contact information, that's the place to go. Uh, next to that is a quick access to a STARS login page. And then finally moving to the right, our newsletter. So we list all our newsletters here. We have all the different archive newsletters. So if you ever wanna look back at one from previous months or years, you can uh, do that right there. And then moving on to the tabs. Um, let's start with the forms tab. So the forms tab as an athletic director is gonna probably be the place you wanna be most of the time. So here we have all of the current year forms and I must stress it's important that you're always using the current year. Rules and policies change and the forms are adjusted accordingly. So it will have the year on there. So you're looking for 20, 20, 21, 22 year, make sure it always says that on your form. So all the forms are clickable here. And what we've also done is sort of put a little chart that talks about the situation in which you would use this form and also have the handbook policy and the section number where you can find more information to make sure that this is the right form um, based on the policy. So you might wanna pop into the handbook, read it over and make sure that it's appropriate that you submit this form. If you can't find in the handbook, by all means, give us a call or an email and we'll help you out with that. So that's the forms tab. It goes quite a ways down, um, a lot of different forms there. So all of the year's forms are there for you. 
Um, a couple mentions that I will make, um, we did do a few name changes on forms. So we have referenced um, that. So for instance, previously known as a school declaration, decoration form is now called change of residence form. Same purpose, we just thought the name of the form was a little bit more um, logical. So that's been changed. And then the second ch significant change would be previously known as the compliance and authorization form, now known as the notification of transfer form. So once again, same purpose, just a new name that we thought was a, a little bit more um, user friendly and logical um, based on the circumstances. Um, the next one I'm going to sort of go on to would be the sports tab. So by clicking on the sports, it's going to give you an alphabetical listing of all the BCSS sanctioned sports. You can drill down on a sport and on that page, you're going to see the sport advisory commission. You're going to see information on the provincial championship the tiering for that sport if there is tiering we happen to be in cross country which is not a tiered sport so uh, that wasn't a great example we'll also have results from previous championships um, there jordan's going to show you the basketball so it'll show you the tiering for the tiering numbers for the various tiers um, yeah and what what we'll do as we get lead up to championships we'll have links to if there's championship websites or webcasting that's where you'll find all of that information there uh, the next one is our news tab. So on the news tab, essentially, it's just going to provide you with a list of all the different news articles that we've sent out to the school. So we archive them there. If you ever want to look back at any of them, that's where you're going to find those. And um, I'm sort of jumping all over the place. Sorry, Jordan. We'll go back to member services. Let's click on that one. Uh, so member services is going to have on the left hand side, the key ones there would be um, under the member services, uh, member schools list you're going to see the tiering numbers that we're using um, for this year and some rationale on some of the, the reasons why we did some change. We have sent some information out on that, but there's the tiering numbers for the seniors, for the senior numbers this year. Um, we also have some information on sanctioned tournaments. I'm gonna to speak a little bit more about sanctioning later, um, but here you'll see uh, a list of third party uh, or non-member school tournaments that have received sanctioning. Um, so as I said, we'll speak a little bit more about that. We also have award winners on the member services page. Um, so we like to hand out a number of awards each year for um, coach merit, uh, a lot of different things. So we'll have recipients there. And then our scholarships, um, we provide a lot of student scholarships. So we'll have bios on the winners, the criteria, and we'll also be posting application forms for the current year. We usually do that around January. So, and we'll also send those out to the schools, but that's where you can direct your students to, but not till probably January. So those are sort of the main pages there. Um, the other page we'll perhaps check back to is the resources page. Jordan um, pointed out a few things there. So one thing I wanna make you um, reference to is on this page, we have a Uh, student athlete one and then the other one would be the coach bulk upload so when we navigate sorry karen one second just you just cut out there for a second so just start with those three things again if you want to just kind of reference what they are sure so we have the stars coach bulk upload template the stu stars student bulk upload template and then also there's information regarding the ci AAA membership activation there We'll get into those bulk upload templates a little later when we um, go through the STARS uh, website. So those are the main features um, of our website. Um, oh, I did, did forget to mention our accommodation directory. So we do have a list of hotels um, that are advertising on our website. They'll provide um, good rates for your teams that are traveling and so forth. Um, so you can view them by city. Um, and so forth. So great place to check out if your team's traveling to provincials or just to a tournament and give them some business. Um, they've, uh, yeah, so those are the main thing. We're back on the website. Oh, and the final thing I guess I'll point to is the sliders that you see go across the front page here. So we try to put a very important um, information there, links to, we have our return to sport guideline. We advertised our athletic director website. We'll have our deadlines flash up there as well. So we have a few of those rotating through. So just to catch your eye. So those are sort of the main features of our website. Um, hopefully you'll find some important information there and use that um, as a resource to help you in your role.
Thanks, Karen. Okay, let's get this slideshow going again. There we go. Uh, sanctioning, let me just turn the camera on so you can see there. Okay. Uh, so again, we're just gonna keep flying through things here. Feel free at any time to uh, just raise your hand using the raise hand feature or type a question into the chat. Um, there's not necessarily distinguished times to sort of ask specific questions. So uh, if there's something that we have covered that you would like more clarity on, just jump in and, and let us know and we'll do that while we're on the topic. Uh, sanctioning. want to make sure this is critical for you as an AD to understand when sanctioning is required. So there's really sort of four types of events. There's, and obviously there's three listed here. The, the main one that we do 90% of the time is when we are either attending uh, a tournament that's hosted by a BCSS member school and competing against only other BCSS member schools. So that's the majority of that. Um, by virtue of being a member, like those those games or matches, tournaments, whatever they might be, are automatically sanctioned. That, that, that's part of the, the membership. So there's nothing required for that. Um, as long as your school is, is playing another member school, all good, carry on, nothing to do um, with us or any paperwork at all. And again, that's the vast majority of high school sport experiences. Uh, there are two types of tournaments that would require um, you to submit some paperwork. And that is if your school is uh, hosting an event with a team that is not a BCSS member school. So that is most commonly a team from out of province or out of country. So whether that be Washington, Oregon, Alberta, Saskatchewan, whatever it might be, if you're hosting a tournament, you need to have that event sanctioned, uh, right? So there's not, there's not an automatic sanctioning for this. Um, it's a paperwork that says, here's the tournament and here's the teams coming. We verify with the, the governing body of that state or province, um, say, hey, this is what we, here's who's coming. They say, yeah, they're a member in good standing, appropriate age group, et cetera. Uh, and, and then that tournament would receive sanctioning. The same goes for if you're traveling to a tournament. If you're traveling to an event, excuse me, outside of uh, BC, then definitely you will want to make sure that there's a sanctioning form. The forms are similar, but slightly different based on which it is. And again, those are on the forms page uh, on our website. So again, if you have a team either hosting or traveling to play a team outside of BC or a non-member school, definitely need to have those events sanctioned. The last one is a little bit different. And that is if you're uh, team, uh, one of your teams is participating in an event that's hosted by a non-member school, usually a third party. Most commonly, this is going to be a college or university, uh, but occasionally, you know, a good example of the Abbotsford Police Tournament um, and different, you know, sometimes golf courses will host a, a high school golf event and it's not that. So how we determine who's hosting? Well, usually we would look at, okay, who is doing the coordinating of the event? So um, who is doing the draws, who's scheduling the officials, doing all that type of thing? Who are the checks made out to? Um, so when kind of looking at all that, most ADs, you'll know right away saying like, oh, yeah, it, we're paying UBC volleyball or we're paying Trinity Western basketball, whatever it might be for this tournament. Um, certainly not a school-based uh, school hosted event. In that case, you will want to make sure that these events have received third-party sanctioning. In fact, you want to probably go as far as making sure the tournament organizer knows that you can't play in the event unless it receives that third-party sanctioning. Uh, and so in this case, the onus is on the host, and, and we do communicate to colleges, universities, and other organizations that we know that host events um, to say, hey, just make sure you get this done. And a similar process, they say, here's the teams we have coming. Uh, they send that to us. When they receive sanctioning uh, on that member services tab where you saw the sanctioning, there's that list of tournaments that have received their sanctioning. That is where you want to make sure that the, the tournament your team is going to is on that list. If a team participates in a, in a non-sanctioned event, um, there will be some sort of penalty, and that can range from anything to uh, you know, a small um, kind of warning letter all the way up to, uh, you know, if you, for example, we've had teams in the past that have played club teams, which is a, a, a big no-no, and, and they can go as far as losing their eligibility for zones and provincials. So basically, they kind of give up their, their high school team status by doing that. Now, there's a range of things in between. We try not to jump right to that very end, obviously, because that's, that's pretty severe. But, um, you know, it, that is a possibility. So it's really important for you to recognize that teams that are going to these events, you want to make sure that they're on that list uh, and make sure the host of those events. So if you're, you know, if you're, if your coach is communicating with the, the head coach or whoever it is organizing the tournament, make sure they know that this has to get done so that 
teams can participate. Uh, further that, if you ever go to a tournament where you think it should be sanctioned and there's a non-high school team playing, um, so even if it's hosted with a, uh, at a, another member school, um, definitely you want to question that and probably not play those games. You want to be playing against other member schools. Um, uh, otherwise, you get into some of those things. And th that's one of the, the things about membership is you play other member schools uh, or receive sanction to play teams from outside of that. So just a heads up uh, on that. Okay, I'm going to hand it back to Karen here because she is the STARS expert and she's going to give you a quick sort of just refresher slash tutorial on some of the key things that you'll do in STARS and we'll keep on rolling. So Karen, uh, I'll turn to you. You can share your screen. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so what I'm going to do is just walk you through some of the components of STARS. Um, I'm sure those that are returning, it'll all come back to you um, very soon, but uh, we're just going to go over a few things that will probably help you um, in your role as athletic director. So those athletic directors that are returning this year, um, you'll probably realize that your access to STARS expired on June 30th. So what we do is we shut down all the STARS access to schools on June 30th. So over the summer, we can work to update our system um, with our developer, get information ready for the next school year. At the end of August, what we do is we go in and send out emails to all the administrators of record in STARS, asking them to opt in to decide to be a member or not uh, for the coming school year. Um, once the administrator completes the opt-in, they have an option at that time to update their athletic director or any contact information in the school. Once they've completed that, it will then provide access, a welcome to the athletic director to now log into STARS and you'll be able to start your, your uploading students and teams for the coming year. So hopefully you've already all successfully done that. Um, and if not, please reach out to me uh, later and we can get you started on that. So what you see here is the home page of, of your school. I'm just going to look. So just like uh, our website, uh, the logo here will always get you back to the home page of your school. So I'm just going to walk you through to some of the different um, features here. We're going to start a little out of order. So the first thing we're going to click on is the student tab. So the student tab is where you're going to add students to your data bank or review the students that are currently in there. So if you click on students, it's gonna provide you with an alphabetical listing by last name of the students that are currently already listed at your school and available for you to add to Teams. The students will see a status here. If it says, yes, the student is available. If it says pending, that means it's still under review with BC School Sports. Until that student status has changed to yes, you will not be able to add them to a roster. If you notice while they're pending, there is an edit button that's still open. If you notice that you've made a mistake in perhaps the student's spelling of their name or their birth date, you can still edit the student at that point. Once they've been approved, you will not have the option of editing them. Any changes, we ask that if you've noticed a small spelling mistake or a birth date change that you don't enter the student again, simply just email us um, and we'll make that change for you. You're just creating a duplicate students when, when you do that. So once you see their students, there's a different way you can toggle back and forth. You can search um, to look for a student by last name, first name. You can look at birth dates if you're looking. You're looking for a specific, um, you just wanna look at the female athletes at your school. So all of these top buttons here, um, the headers, you can toggle between back and forth to look at the status or names and so forth of those students. When it comes time to add new students to your account, there's a couple different ways you can add it. The most common would be you're just adding a single student. So going through, filling out the, the correct information for the student, having their birth date, their grade date, enter date, that's crucial information when you go to add a student. And then the other way to add a student is your new student imports. I have to stress the bulk upload is really meant for your incoming grade. So if you are a eight to 12 school, what we highly recommend is at the start of the school year, you upload all your grade eight students. 
doesn't matter if they're going to play sports or not if you're not sure by putting them in the system there's no harm but then those students are available to you and it'll make your job as an athletic director easy as you move forward this year we're having um, a significant amount of schools because they didn't enter students last year they're wanting to a bulk upload two or more grades for schools that are eight to 12 they're wanting to do their grade eights and nines you're okay to do your grade eights but if you have grade nines you want to do we're asking that you send those to us we can do uh, a different entry where it will they'll get approved a lot faster and it'll just um, help with our workload um, and help get those students available to you um, a lot sooner. For some schools that are a nine to 12 or a different grade configuration, um, please consult with us. Don't just try to bulk upload your whole um, population. That's not what the bulk upload is intended for because if a student has transferred or anything like that, they can't be entered by bulk upload. So if in question, please just email us. We'd be happy to help you with that. Um, the other feedback we received with the bulk upload is that our system is not in line with the MyEd system. So um, if you're taking information from the school's registration database, the birth year is in one column. We are asking for it in three. So someone that can, um, you know, has had a little bit of experience in Excel could probably split those columns. We're happy to help with that, or we do have a, a short little uh, how-to guide. We'd be happy to send you, but if you're having struggles with that, by all means, reach out to us. We'd be happy to help with that. Um, so that's sort of the student um, upload. Does anybody have any questions with regards to that? No? Okay, we're gonna move on to coaches. So you've got your students in the system and the next thing is coaches. Um, a lot of you might have not noticed, but we did send out quite a bit of information on this. We chose over the summer to um, archive all our coaches that were in the database. The reason we chose to do this is we found that most of their contact information was out of date or old, and we just didn't have that way to communicate to coaches. Um, in the event of emergency, last minute's coaching, you know, scheduling change and so forth. So we have removed all the coaches. Um, and there's a couple ways. You can re-add your coaches one by one, or you can send us a bulk upload and we have to upload that. So um, as we referred to earlier on our resource page of our website, we do have that um, coach bulk upload form there. I'm happy to do that for you. So we do have a little note in here in case you forget, and we did send some information out. But critical, before you can add a team, you have to have your coach. So um, if you want to just add your team, your coaches one by one as you do your teams, that's fine as well. But just stressing, we want their contact information. Um, it's mandatory information now when you're adding a coach. So in past years, we've seen a lot of athletic directors just because they didn't know the information at the time of entering the coach, they would just put their own. If that's the case, you always have the option of editing. We stress, please go back and edit. That way we can include our coaches in you know, important information relevant to their sport. So once you've got your coaches, the next is your teams. So if you click on the teams button, you're gonna see a drop down or an add team button. Once you click on add team, it's going to give you a option to drop down and select all the available teams. If it's a senior sport, which is tiered, it's only going to provide the tier that is relevant to your sport numbers. If you've been approved for a different tier, um, you'll need to contact our office to um, make the arrangement to put the appropriate tier in. So you can select your coach, your teams from there. You have to add a coach and you go through and save your team. The one question I get a lot of is um, the one question at the very end, it's will this team be your provincial representative? My answer is just always put yes. The only time that you would put no is if you are declaring two teams in the same sport and gender, um, a large school might choose to have two teams. You need to identify which of those teams um, would be the one that would be qualifying for provincials. But other than that, always just put the yes there. Does anybody have any questions so far on coaches, students, or teams? Okay. 
just going to go back a little to the teams button and so i've declared these teams already for my school here if you are ever wanting to look back at previous years you can drill down it has numbers of years back and look at some of the teams that you had in those years if you want to be more specific i don't have any previous teams because this is a sample you can drill it down into a specific sport uh, a specific gender a specific tier so you can go back and look at some sport history um, if you want to um, the other thing once you've got your teams in here we're going to go look at a roster so let's just go back here to clear this so looking at my basketball roster if i click on view it'll show me my basketball roster we always recommend that coaches or athletic directors provide coaches with rosters. So through here, you can hit a generate PDF and it will populate a roster for you and you can just hand it to your coach to take to games. Um, kind of a nice feature there. Also, if you're adding your school logo, I'll show you how to do that. It'll also populate that on the roster as well. So we've Aaron, done- We got a quick question from Scott. And <laughs> I don't know exactly what it's referencing, but he says, even for junior teams, I'm not sure. Scott, do you want to unmute yourself or just clarify exactly what you're asking there? Sure. It's with regards to when you said, is this my provincial representative? Yes or no. I mean, would, would a junior team automatically not be a provincial representative? So the question is a little, the way the system was set up, we, um, BC School Sports doesn't run um, sanctioned provincial um, represent we don't run provincial championships for juniors it's just a default question so it has to be yes or no um i'm just saying to do yes because it really doesn't it doesn't impact us in any in any other way it would just be at the senior level if you had two teams in the same sport in the same level um sport and gender so it's simpler just to put yes on all of them because it really doesn't have any impact on the team does that answer the question? No, oh, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Um, so the next thing I'm going to go um, look at is the student transfers. So if you Sorry, just, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, I did end up putting no. Is, should I go back and change it to yes for my junior teams? No, it doesn't matter. It has to be answered. And I just said, you know, yes, it, it's not going to change. Um, it's not going to change anything. To be honest, I feel like it should be a question and we're not able to remove it from there. It was set up a long time ago. So either way, it's fine. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no worries. So we're going to go back and if you clicked on student transfers, um, I don't have any transfers, but if you had had students that had been transferred to your school, you would just see a list of them there. So if you had submitted some transfer paperwork, maybe missed an email, if you clicked on student transfers, you would see the students that we BC School Sports had transferred to your school. Uh, the next uh, item over is our tools button. So by clicking on that, it's going to pop up a few different um, tools that you can use through the STARS website. Um, the main one I would suggest that people are going to use the most would be the moving up form. So the moving up form is used if you have students that are playing on a younger age roster and you want to move them up to the more senior team. So the way our rule works, if you have a student playing on a younger age roster in the same sport, through league play, they can play unlimited on the senior team or the more senior team without being moved up to that roster. When we reach playoffs, if you want them to play in playoffs on the more senior team, you have to officially move them up to that team. You can do this. This is the only form we have that's done online. So to do that, you're going to click on the move up forms. And then it's going to ask you what team from the drop down menu, you're going to select the team you want to move them up to. So I'm going to select my senior boys basketball team. Once I've done that, it's going to populate a list of students that are registered on the more the junior team or the younger age team in the same sport that are available to move up. From here, you can select one or by holding your control key down, you can select more than one student that you want to move up. I've selected Jack. It's going to ask you what day you want to do it on. So it automatically will default to the day that the form is being processed. You can click on that and it gives you a calendar. So if you want to just do this in advance, you're an organized person, you're like, okay, I know that the juniors finished their playoffs on October 14th. I want him to move up on the 15th. We're going to select the 15th and then you're going to hit submit. 
what it's going to do is then go through a confirmation page because once you make this change it's we can't undo it so make sure you check the data yes i want to do this if you're sure you want to do it you hit submit it's going to then come send an email to um, our office we're going to review the request and move the student up on the requested date and send you an email once it's done so that's sort of the move up. Does anybody have any questions with regards to that? No. Just, to, just want to provide some clarity there on that policy, just so everyone's clear. So when it comes to the moving up, as a reminder, and I know Karen touched on it, but your juniors can play up to the senior team throughout the regular season, uh, exhibition play and invitational play without requiring this. They can kind of go back and forth. There's no limit on the amount of games they can play. Um, just one thing that is a limit on is the maximum number of playing days. So um, if you look at that in, in, in the maximum number of playing days does apply to individuals as well as teams. So if a student's playing 15 days and this team and another 30 here, they're likely over. But for all intents and purposes, they can move back and forth without paperwork. As soon as you want the younger player to play up in a postseason game, um, so that's for some of you that will be zones, and for some of you that will be before zones in terms of when your your local playoffs start. Um, they must be on the senior roster, and once they are on that roster, they cannot go back down and play. So even if they don't get into the game, so say it's volleyball and the, there's a junior kid and you want to play him at your your league final or the I don't know the Surrey final, um, he has to he or she has to be moved up to that roster. Even if they don't get in the game, once they're on that roster, they cannot move back down and they're no longer eligible for the lower team. So again, once there's postseason play, they must be on the roster. And once they're on that higher roster, they can't be moved back down. And this is and what Karen just showed you is the, the method on how to do that. Uh, next, moving forward, the event and sanctioning form, we actually don't use that feature. I mean, it's there. It doesn't really serve a purpose. Um, the next one that we get a lot of is general inquiries. Um, so essentially what you're doing is just sending an email to our office um, by creating this. Um, there is some select topics and so forth. Um, and you can put a bit of a description in here. I personally recommend um, just sending an e email to info at BC School Sports. You can provide a lot more detail in the email directly to us. Um, the general inquiry has a limitation and topics that you need to select and so forth. So you can do it if you're in there and it's just easier for you, but the info at BC School Sports, just an email to us is going to uh, serve if not um, the same purpose or probably a better avenue for you to communicate with us. The last in here is the CSB exports. So uh, a lot of times at the end of the school year, schools will provide athletic awards to students that have participated in sports or a number of different sports and they wanna get some statistics. Here you can generate some reports. Um, you can see which students um, are multi-sport athletes. So they've participated in more than one sport during the year. Um, the other thing, if you're trying to do, like go to your administration and say, look, we've really increased our participation over the years. You can pull a report on previous years participation and sort of track numbers and so forth. Um, and then finally, you can look at student participation by grade and gender. It's gender. It's just going to give you a report for this year. I had this many grade eight girls, this many grade eight boys participate on teams and so forth. So that's um, the three, uh, sorry, the four functions under the tools. Um, and then the last is the user. Um, if you click on that, it's just going to show you who is, who has had access to stars from your school. It'll have old ones. You can usually tell who the active users are by the last login date. Um, and then one more thing I wanted to touch on going back to the home screen. We spoke a little bit about um, team logos and so forth. So when you're on your home screen, you can go in and edit some information, although we don't really want you to. Um, you can't ever edit the numbers, but you could edit an address, a uh, contact person. By doing that and not letting us know, um, they could miss out by getting, I've had people go on in and they go, oh, we got a new athletic director. So they just go in and edit and change it. But then Jane Smith didn't get a STARS login because we didn't know that got changed. So I would suggest that those just get emailed to info at BC School Sports to make sure that they're getting all the appropriate access that they need. 
The one thing you can do though, by hitting on edit, if you have a school logo, just scrolling down on the page here, there is an option for you to upload your logo and crest here just by choosing the file and so forth. Um, you can put your team colors and stuff and all that is not mandatory information, but if you want it to be on there. By putting your logo on there, as I said, when you populate, populate your rosters, it will show up on there. And then also if we're ever doing social media and your team won something in provincial championships, it's a way for us to grab your team logo as well. So that's sort of the basic um, bolts of stars. Um, does anybody have any questions on something I might not have covered or I did and you want some further clarification? We had a couple of questions in the chat that I answered, but just for the sake of the recording for people who may watch this after the fact or those that aren't following the chat, question was around um, if we don't have a junior team, can we just, do the students need to be moved off to play in the senior team? And the answer is no. So basically we have grade eight and nine and junior and senior designations, but really at, at some of our smaller schools, uh, grade eights and nines may play in the senior team. So, that, and that's perfectly fine uh, to do that. Um, and they don't need to be moved up because then they're on that roster. But where you have a situation, usually in the bigger centers where they might have a grade nine team and a grade 10 team, or at least a junior team and a senior team, what they're saying is we want only juniors playing in this league. And then obviously for, for provincial purposes, they're going to move up to play um, with the higher team. And that, that's where you have that move up where they're on a lower level team. Um, but certainly if you only have the one team or you have a grade eight team, a senior team, um, you, you know, you could put those grade nines right on the senior roster without problem. And then if they're on that roster, you don't need to move them up. Um, it's only if you have the different kind of delineated teams. So hopefully that's clear for everyone and feel free to ask for more clarification if that's not clear. I see a question from Owen first. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, I, I never seem to get the format right for the uh, grade eight upload. Uh, so I'm getting errors for the year of birth, month, and day, even though it says the year and the month and the birth and the day, just how it does in the headings. Is there something that yeah, we just, need to know? Yeah, just send it over to us, um, Owen. I'm happy to. Uh, the formatting is very finicky, so right. um, if it's not in the exact format and the month and date aren't two-digit numbers um, and they're not split, you're going to have that error, but happy to um, have a look at that and upload that for you. Okay, I'll just send it to you then. Perfect. Okay, thanks. Cam, you had a question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, tried to sign up for the newsletter, entered my credentials, and then uh, all I got was a blank form again. It didn't say error message or anything like that. Um, so just wondering if there's an issue on the site or am I, do am I doing it wrong? I don't know. It's only, there's only two fields to fill out, so. I'll definitely look at that, Cam. Are you uh, an athletic director at a school? Uh, yes, I am. And I, I uh, have signed up on STARS already, too. So And you should automatically receive our newsletters. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we automatically send them to um, the athletic director and administrator at each school that are members. So um, you should get them. Um, okay. Yeah. All right, that takes care of it, then, I'm sure. Thanks. Well, I will look into the newsletter. Thank you very much for letting us know. Okay. Before we move on, does anybody else have any other questions? Um, I do. Um, we have several international students and sorry, I'm a new athletic director. Um, the coach has printed me a form that says international boarding student athlete form. I'm just wondering, is there a spot that I enter them specifically? So good question. Um, so they do need to be, we need the form sent to us and they need to be added in STARS, unfortunately, they do need to be added as single students. When you're adding a single student at the very bottom of the page here, I'm just going to give you an example. The very bottom here, it's got a transfer type. If you hit the drop down, you're going to identify them as an international student. Um, so that lets us know we need that form. And until we have that form, we are not going to approve that student. Um, do you have a lot of international students, Wendy? I think we have uh, about five. Well, we have quite a few, actually. So I have probably three on my team. There's five on the field hockey team. I am anticipating, yeah, definitely over 10. Okay. If you have a lot, you could reach out to me and we could try to do something on um, 
where you sent them to me on a bulk form and I can manipulate it with that. So if, if it becomes uh, too much for you to do them singular, reach out to me and we can um, arrange something different there. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anything else? There's a question in the chat from Lily asking, where can we see if the school has paid the BCSS fees? Yeah, unfortunately, we used to have that in um, in stars, we took that feature out. So if you um, want to pop an email, I'm more than happy to check that for you, uh, Lily. Jill, you had a question. Yes, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, so if we have students coming in in grade nine, um, do we automatically have to do a transfer form or like um, if yeah. Sorry, Jill, are you, what, what is the grade configuration of your school? We're at, and I have grade eight to 12. Well, I have a JK to 12, but we upload in grade eight. But if we have a student coming in in grade nine, do I have to automatically do a transfer form? Yeah, so you should be doing the grade eight, nine transfer form. And um, we will see if they were in another school. And um, if they were, we'll transfer their athletic program profile to your school. And if not, we'll upload them for you. Oh, okay. And so that would go all the way through to grade 12 if, it, if they happen to come. So just the grade eight, nine transfer form you can use in that case. Um, okay. Students from grade 10 forward, you're using a notification of transfer form. Okay. Another, another question from uh, Jennifer Oltway said, uh, is there any need to put student coaches on the team registrations or just keep the adult sponsoring as the contact deals and listed as the coach. So on that one, I think we, we would like to see anybody who's involved in coaching to have them on that. I know it's a little bit more work, but there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, the first one is just in case of emergency purposes, we, we know who is involved with the team. Uh, and the second one is often we are, you know, reporting statistics for government for trying to get funding or other grant purposes. And they're looking to see, well, how many coaches and stuff are, uh, are involved and participants. So that's a, it's good to have accurate numbers. And that was part of the reason why we chose to sort of start over with the coaches database because the pre previous data was really um, flawed and it was just sort of being recycled every year. So um, yes, we would like you to put all your coaches in, uh, in some sports, when it gets to zones and provincials, we'll say the, the coaches aren't even allowed on the bench or sideline and, unless they're in stars appropriately. So please add all your coaches, not just your, your one coach. Jill, did you have another question? No, sorry. I just realized I didn't put my hand down. Not a problem. Great questions, everyone. Anything else? Okay, then I'm going to stop sharing here and let Jordan uh, move on to the next part of the presentation. Okay, let's get back here share this and off we go. Uh, okay, so we're gonna keep going and get a little bit into the policy side here. Uh, just as again, reminders, um, we're not gonna get really into the, the weeds, but just a healthy or sorry, ha yeah, helpful reminders, I should say. Uh, for every season of play, so we have three seasons of play, fall, winter, and spring. Um, every season of play has two deadlines. The first of those is the roster uh, or team, sorry, roster is incorrect. The first deadline is the team registration deadline. And for that, that means you have to have your team created in STARS. Uh, and the two other requirements are you need to have minimum members, and that's different for every sport. And you need to have at least one coach listed. Okay. So again, the, the team deadline is the first, always the first deadline. Uh, for your reference, the team deadline for fall is October 6th. So that's coming up in about a week and a half or so, a little less than that. So just be aware of that date, October 6th. And again, what you need to have is the team created in STARS, the minimum numbers met. And again, that's different for individual sports. That's usually one. For team sports, it's whatever the, you know, the membership is deemed sort of the safe minimum. So for volleyball, it's, I believe it's six. For basketball, it's seven. Uh, soccer, I believe it's 11 or 12. So you need to have the minimum numbers, which is basically saying, hey, yes, we do have the numbers uh, of kids to have on this team. Once you have that, you're fine for the team deadline. You then have until the roster deadline, which is always the second deadline in every season of play. 
and the roster deadline, it's usually about two weeks after the team deadline. So you usually have about a two week buffer to finalize rosters, double check, make sure all the kids on that roster um, or on that team are into stars. So again, first one, team, minimum numbers, coach, and created in stars. Second, <clears throat> excuse me, second deadline is the roster. Rosters become locked after that. There are then, <clears throat> excuse me, fines and penalties to add students to the, de uh, to the rosters after the roster deadline. The roster deadline for fall is October 20th. We try and pick Wednesdays. They're all on Wednesdays this year so that they aren't sort of um, around weekends and, and long weekends and get mixed up. So uh, Wednesday, October 6th, team deadline, Wednesday, October 20th, roster deadline. Is there any questions on the rosters um, and the deadlines required for stars? Jordan, I just have one question. If I just registered uh, students today into there and I'm just awaiting a confirmation from someone that they're registered and then I do the teams and the roster after, right? Correct, so you will not mm -hmm. be able, so good, great point, Ralph. Thanks for the good question. Um, it, we try, we say that we will get all your students approved in two business days. So, yeah. you know, what you don't want to do is wait till October 5th and upload 200 new students to put on rosters. Cause you're going to end up not having the kids available to put on the team. Okay. So make sure you're giving yourself enough buffer time that if you have a whole bunch of new students, especially for your grade eight or grade nine teams, where they may be new to your school or new to stars, um, that process does take up to two days. We try and do it faster than that, but we are getting literally thousands per day. Um, mm -hmm. And the system, it, you know, it does take some time to, to chug through them. So make sure you're getting those in soon enough that it gives you um, some time after the two day, two business day buffer to get those kids onto the appropriate rosters. Yeah, and, and, and on that CSV Excel spreadsheet, it's okay that you add all the kids at once. It doesn't matter as far as putting them in grade or teams at that point, right? You're just wanting the kids' names. Correct. So there's two, uh, another good question. So just to be clear, there's kind of two steps to the process. There's one, getting the kids into the system and attached to your school. And that's sort mm -hmm. of that, reg that, that process that Karen showed of how to, you know, whether it's import new students, um, bulk upload, create new students one at a time. Uh, and so that kind of gets them when you, when you click on that students button, it shows you all the students. So those are basically all the students that you have that we have said, hey, these are your students ready to, to be added. If they're not on there, that's where that two day process comes in where we have to get them added. So that's the submission, so forth. That's the first step. Once they're there, the second step is creating the team and adding the students to the roster. Okay, so you gotta make sure that both pieces of that are done. Just if they're listed in your students, that's halfway. You gotta make sure you create the team and get those students listed and, and on that roster as applicable. I, I was just confused at first. I was just wondering if I needed to send, send two different spreadsheets for each team. Right, nope. I can just put them all in one team, one or yeah. one spreadsheet. For all. Correct. The, the, you don't even need the spreadsheets. We don't even need for teams. Um, you, no. you 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 do the teams yourself. The the bulk uploads are really to help because if you have like, literally a couple hundred new kids, trying to enter okay. them one by one is very painful. If you can take an export from your office and just kind of make it work within the template, saves a ton of time. It gets the kids into the system, attached to your school within a couple of days. And then from there, you can create your teams and rosters as you see fit. Oh, and one other thing on my ad uh, versus your spreadsheet, on my ad, I believe the date of birth comes first and then the month and or it's reverse of your spreadsheet. So you always have to, I don't know if I can change the spreadsheet for you guys. I don't know if you understand what I mean. Yeah, well, no, exactly. Yeah, my, my ad system has the birth date actually in one column. So um, if you're having problems splitting it into three, by all means, send it to us. From memory, I believe you're from a middle school, are you not? Yes. So are you trying to upload all your grade eights? Uh, I did all my grade eights and grade nines. I'm just saying when I went to find their birth dates on the spreadsheet, the template on, on stars, yep. it, I, I believe it says, let me just look at one of the people's birthday right now. So I believe it's reverse. It's um, date on my head. It's date, then month, then year. And then on your spreadsheet, it's month, date, and then year. So it's opposite. Have you so already, you have to change it all the time rather than... Well, maybe we should speak offline because I'm guessing that if you already did this, that the information is incorrectly, but if we, we can we can help you... No, I, I switched it myself. Okay. Have but, you yeah. already done the upload then, Ralph? 
Yeah, I sent it today. So you sent it to BCSS or you uploaded it yourself? I, I did a spreadsheet and then uh, on your template and then I uploaded it to STARS okay. and sent it and it said you successfully wait for, I don't know, two days. And so your whatever. grade eights would get automatically approved. Your grade nines, um, ideally we would like you to send those to us because then we can do an auto approve. So you're going to have to wait the two days or if you want. Okay. We can speak oh. offline. We can get that done in a different way. Okay. But I, I'm way ahead of schedule anyways. So there's no rush. I can wait two days. Yeah, it just helps us if we're not everybody is uploading them, but we can, I'll send you an email after. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Just to provide clarity on what that, because if you, there's just, if it goes in a certain way, the system can check all the things it needs to check and it auto uploads. So it basically just approves those kids. Um, if it comes in in a certain different way, then we actually have to go through every student one by one, check their athletic history, and then approve approve them one by one. And as you can imagine, you know we've got seventy thousand kids a year. Uh, uh, roughly a fifth of that is new every year, and so that that's a that is a task that is um, very large to take on. So that's where we try and streamline it where we can to help just efficiencies and keep everything moving. So. Good questions, though, Ralph. Thanks for that. And I'm sure Karen will touch base with you. I see a hand up there. Uh, who do we have here? I have my window closed. Go ahead. Can't see your name. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. It's, it's Wendy. Um, oh, Wendy just to clarify, sorry, I think, you've, I think you've already answered, but new athletic director, I just want to clarify. Our school is grade 10 to 12, so I'm able to bulk upload the grade 10s, but if I want to bulk upload the grade 11s because of COVID, they're probably not in there. I need to email you or how did that work again? Can you just repeat that part? Yeah, when we actually don't want you bulk uploading your grade 10s, um, can you maybe, oh. you that, please? yeah, if they, depending, yeah, if they're coming from a feeding from a middle school, I'm not sure what school you're from, but um, those kids might have already fed into your system. So uh, if you can touch base with me by email and then I can give you best directions based on your school configuration, how we should deal with that. Thank you. The challenges of a new athletic director, right? When you, it's, it's, we have, um, just for clarity, there's 21 different grade configurations across your membership. So trying to create sort of simple and easy rules is very difficult because it, it applies sort of differently to everybody. And then our star system is, you know, a better part of a decade old. And so, you know, it doesn't always line up perfectly with, with the new systems like my ed and so forth. So um, yeah, there's a lot of moving pieces and you're asking the right questions and certainly uh, Karen will help you kind of get through that uh, as efficiently as possible. Thank you. You bet. Okay, we're going to move on here. Feel free to jump in anytime again if you have got further questions from anybody. Uh, code of conduct, just want to bring this up to uh, your attention as a reminder. It's always good for ADs just to have a, a quick look at sort of the code of conduct at the start of the year. Very good to go through with your coaches when you have coaches meetings, uh, make sure they're aware of it. There's codes of conduct for student athletes, which should be reviewed with each student, not individually, obviously, but as teams kind of formed, review the code of conduct with your coaches. And then there's one for spectators. Um, and so it's important that, you know, you're controlling that the environment of your gym and so forth and ensuring that the behavior um, coincides with that. So uh, just take a look at that. The second piece I'll draw your attention to is we do have a social media policy. And I know that in today's day and age, there's there's a lot happening um, on all those different uh, realms. And so just again, a good thing to review with your coaches and student athletes, It's it does give sort of best practices and, and basic expectations. It's nothing crazy. It's what you'd expect. It says, you know, we're going to be positive. We're not going to attack officials, coaches, other players. Um, we're going to represent our schools uh, and, and organizations in the right manner and that type of thing. But again, important for you to review with your coaches and with your student athletes. Lastly, if there is an issue with code of conduct, and you know we do deal with a handful of these every year, um, we did tweak the process a couple of years ago. And just so you understand how it works is there's a code of conduct complaint form that you can get from BC School Sports. Fill that out, send that to us. Um, from there, it depends on whether it was a, if it was an exhibition, regular season or invitational event, um, then we would give that to the local association to, to deal with. Some local associations are, are great um, and have a system set up and have experience with it and they might have a committee and they will process it, uh, deal with it and let us know what the outcome was. Some associations don't really have that capacity. And so then they have the option to then ask us to take over sort of reviewing that um, incident. If the event happens at a zone or provincial championship, then we will just deal with that automatically. Anyway. 
outcomes. So that's just sort of the flow of how we deal with those. Again, you know, we deal with a handful of them a year. They're not that common, but just want you to understand that should something happen um, that you're not impressed about, there's a way to, to kind of bring it forward. Um, or if should something happen with one of your student athletes or coaches, then this is the process that you know, we will go through. Okay. All right. Student eligibility. So um, again, I'm going to defer to Karen here in a minute, but just want to set, set the stage briefly. Uh, we're going to talk about eligibility and then transfers. And it's really important to understand the difference between sort of eligibility policy and transfer policy. And the best way to think about it is eligibility policies are those that every student must meet all the time to be able to play. To be able to, to, to sort of have eligibility, they have to meet these things. And Karen will give... Um, a little bit more detail on each of them. Whereas transfer policy is really what comes into play only when a student goes from school A to school B. Okay, And so we're, we're gonna go through uh -oh. these, um, both sort of the core rules and a little bit about the COVID rules, uh, just so everybody's on the same page. And uh, then we'll take some questions after that. So Karen uh, is gonna review just sort of the key five pieces to, to eligibility, which again, applies to all students all the time. Thanks Jordan. So we like to break it down into five key requirements. Um, the first one is age. So a student must be under the age of 19 as of December 31st of the current school year to be age eligible. Uh, the next one is residency. So they have to meet one of the following. They either need to live in BC with a parent or parents live in BC with a legal guardian, and that legal guardianship must be in place for 12 months prior to seeking eligibility. They must be a full-time student. Um, so we deem a full-time student, uh, a student that is, well, full-time student status is taking eight courses or 32 credits. We allow a student that is taking a minimum of 62.5% of a full-time credit load to be eligible. So 62.5% equates to five classes. So they have to be enrolled five classes. If they're in a semester system school, they have to be taking a minimum of two per semester. So one of the semesters would be three. Um, so that's that. Um, and then the next one of, is years of eligibility. So each student gets five years of eligibility from the day they enter grade eight. That eligibility calendar runs consecutively regardless whether they choose to play or not in a given year or years. And then the final one is compete for the school of record. So a student is eligible at the school that they are registered at. In the case where a student is cross enrolled, what we will look at is the percentage of course load. So if it's a 50-50 course load at the two schools, they're going to be eligible at the school that they were first registered at. And otherwise, if it's not a, an equal course load, we're gonna be looking at the school that they have the greatest course load. And that's where they're going to be, that's gonna be considered their school of record for athletics. So those are the five key components to student eligibility. Oh, I missed one in the full-time, sorry, in the residency. The other one would be if they were a full-time, sorry, if they were attending a school as an international or boarding student, which is recognized by their school district and or um, school, if it's an independent school office, and they have to be here for a minimum of five months. Those are the five key eligibility requirements. Does anybody have any questions with regards to those? Okay, I'm gonna Jen, let you... uh, Jen, Jen's got one. Okay. Thank, thanks. Um, I just, with respect to when kids are cross enrolled and are maybe doing like a district sort of program temporarily, mm -hmm. uh, it just, it's just their last home school, correct? So as long as they're cross enrolled, but even if all of their courses are at the district program, it's their last home school? Uh, no, we'd have to look at the district program and so forth. So depending on where that's hosted, it, their athletic eligibility might transfer to that school. And if they don't have athletics at an alternate type of program? Then we do have provisions under the alternate or distributed okay. learning um, to accommodate that. Okay, and is there a form, like they're probably still in BC Stars under my school because it's a, is there Probably, 
Yeah, the best thing was probably send the personal record card and then I can direct you if we're going to be doing the distributor alternate school form to uh, determine their eligibility. But okay, don't awesome. I just will... the roster first. Yeah, maybe send a PR card and then I can look at that for you. And don't add it to the roster currently until we talk about it. Okay. Right. Um, okay perfect. Thank you. Is that the same as um, if there's no team at their school and they come to the nearest school, which is ours, we would still do something similar to that? send it to you first or we actually don't have provisions in our rules for students to play at another school because their school doesn't offer a program um i shouldn't say that, but the only provision we have would be a joint team application so school students can't just go to the next school to play a sport because their school doesn't offer a program okay so um we've done it in the past i, I was an athletic director so i'm wondering um it might have been done under a joint team, jointly sponsored team application where two or more schools come together and complete an application for their, their schools to um, have that team jointly. Um, for that reason, usually um, some of the smaller, more rural schools um, that don't have the population to do that. Um, so I'm not sure what your circumstances, but once again, probably a conversation that we can have to best determine how to handle that situation. You bet, thank you. Okay, um, all great questions. So please keep them coming. We're gonna keep moving here, not to get too bogged down, but um, I think the, the answers are very helpful for many people. So thank you for asking good questions. Uh, I'm gonna take over here and talk about transfers a little bit. So I'm gonna start by talking about sort of the, the core transfers. Um, the first thing I'll say is I'll draw your attention to section 920 in the handbook. I'm not gonna bring it up because I know you all know where it is. This is sort of the, the key transfer piece. In there, there is a whole bunch of different things that um, will allow students to transfer and, and so forth. So it's important to kind of be aware of that section, but we're gonna kind of focus on, on four key ones uh, and, and sort of present how those work. Cause that's probably about 90 to 95% of transfers. Um, you know, Jennifer's last question just about that, you know, there are other more um, kind of intricate situations that we do have policy for, but you won't come across them very often. And when you do, it, us just to kind of call and we can kind of walk through the scenario and what the options might be. Um, but really there's four key, tra key transfers that happen most commonly and we just want to kind of go through those. Before we do that, I have to understand sort of when a transfer uh, is required and what that means. Um, and so really a student becomes athletically tied to a school on the first day of grade nine. So we call that establishing their home school. Um, there's again, if they play up from a middle school to a senior school, there's some technical pieces, but again, pretty rare for almost every student, it will be the first day of grade nine, um, they will become tied to that school athletically. Uh, anytime a student transfers to your school, um, if they if they are in STARS, which means they've either played in grade eight and are coming uh, to your school, they, that requires transfer paperwork or transfer submission or anytime a kid comes after um, that, they also require, <laughs> basically, probably if a kid's coming to your school, other than through a natural progression from middle school to secondary school, they likely need to have something submitted to BC School Sports. Uh, and so basically that, that grade nine, the first day of grade nine is when it really the transfer rules kick in, okay? The key, I guess the starting point for transfers is, and this goes for kind of everybody is whenever we talk to principals or counselors, athletic directors, if you ever have a question about, well, will this kid be eligible? Will they won't be eligible? Um, obviously every situation is different. The key starting point is the core kind of eligibility rule states, any student that transfers schools, uh, basically after they've established their home school is subject to the, tr uh, the transfer rule which states the student is ineligible for a period of 12 months in any sport they played in the 12 months leading up to the transfer. So it's kind of the 12 months before affects the 12 months after. So again, one more time, the student, the starting point is always and should always be to any of your students or inquiries you get. If you're coming to the school after the first day of grade nine for any sports you played in the previous year leading up to the transfer, you're gonna be ineligible in those sports for the next 12 months. Okay. If that's kind of the starting point, then we can kind of go from there uh, and look at the different options. So we kind of refer to that 12 month period as the kind of ineligibility period. The students are essentially 
partially ineligible because they can they can participate in sports they didn't play previously right away. There's no ineligibility period for that. It's only in those sports that they played in the previous 12 months. Now, um, what section 920 indicates is all the different reasons why a student may not have to sit out for that year after a transfer. And these are basically things that the membership has indicated that yes, if they meet the standard of this policy, then we will allow them to play right away. They don't have to sit out that year. Like anything with school sport, it's always trying to find that balance of obviously we want kids participating. We know the impact and power uh, that school sport can have. But at the same time, we also want to maintain sort of the competitive balance and integrity and intentions behind school sports. So everybody's personal line may be drawn somewhere slightly different, but that's sort of as an organization where that, where that has been drawn. So section 920, again, those are the reasons that may apply to a student that, um, so they don't have to sit out the year. Now, if you're not interested in getting that year of elig ineligibility removed, you simply submit a notification of transfer formally the compliance and authorization. So notification of transfer isn't a form that requires adjudication or review. Um, it's not, you're not looking to gain that eligibility. Simply what you're doing with a notification transfer is saying, this kid has now arrived at our school and has enrolled at our school. Uh, these are the sports they have played in the previous 12 months. We recognize they're ineligible for the next year, but please move them to our system so we can add them to other teams and in 12 months that they will become automatically eligible. So that's notification transfer. It's not a, there's no cost to it because there's no adjudication. It is simply just uh, the tool that tells us that this kid is now at your school and what sport. We will then take the information that you've provided cross references against STARS. Um, if there's no discrepancy, we'll just move that kid over and 12 months from the date of enrollment at your school, they will become fully eligible. In the meantime, you'll be able to add them to any sports um, that they weren't that they're not ineligible for. Okay, so that's a notification of transfer. If you are looking to get that 12 month ineligibility period waived so that the student can participate right away, you're gonna fill out um, usually one of two forms. The first one is the change of residence form. And that is gonna be used under two circumstances, either the change of principal residence. So the family has disposed of the previous residence, has moved locations with the idea that it is permanent. Uh, and so this family is in a different location or it's a parent to parent move. So obviously split family uh, or split parents and the student is moving from one parent to the other parent. That again is not meant to be temporary. It's sort of usually there's a, uh, in those situations, there's a, a spot the student considers their home. Uh, they get two of those moves throughout their uh, high school career. Uh, on the third one, they're then subject to transfer rules, okay? So change of residence form is for principal residence change or parent to parent moves. In that case, what you are submitting is a application that says, this student has transferred to our school as a result of a change of residence. You, we are, you're asking to have that reviewed and adjudicated by one of your eligibility officers. They'll look at the documentation that's provided they will look at that versus does it meet the standard and policy? And so when I say change of principal residence, if you look at the policy in 921 or 923, maybe um, it's, there's some criteria it has to meet. Okay. So it, they're going to say, does it meet the criteria that the membership has said, yes, this is good. They make a, they make a assessment of that and make a ruling um, with the ch change of principal residence, you know, it's relatively successful in most cases, uh, but we do know that there are abuses of it, so it does get reviewed. If the eligibility officer grants eligibility, that student does not have to sit out the 12 months and they can carry on playing uh, all their sports right away. If the eligibility officer denies that, then it go, it, you, the student remains ineligible for those 12 months in those sports that they played previously, um, and then the school has the option to do nothing or to appeal that should they feel it's required. And we'll get into that in a second. So that's the change of residence. The other form is an eligibility application. And I see your hand there, I'll, I'll get to that in one sec. The eligibility application is the other submission that goes to the eligibility officer. Again, it's asking for the removal of that 12 month ineligibility period. And the three most common reasons for that, again, there's a whole bunch of kind of very infrequently used other ones, but the three most common are bonafide academic transfer, bullying, and financial hardship. 
Okay, and I'll talk about each of those quickly just so you kind of have an understanding of how they work. Bonafide academic transfer requires uh, the student to move uh, transfer schools. Again, this doesn't require a change of principal residence. So the student may not have moved their family home, but they're now going to a different school. And the academic transfer may be because they need three courses in a related program of study that weren't available at the previous school. Again, one more time, three courses in a related program of study not available at the previous school. Generally now with the flexibility of education, especially in uh, urban environments where there's bigger schools and more offerings, it's generally pretty tough to find that nowadays. Um, we, deal, we still do see it sometimes in rural where a certain school may have a, a focus program or something like that. Um, but again, we don't want kids picking tiddlywinks and basket weaving and, and whatever and saying, oh, this is these three, you know, three totally unrelated courses. These, are, these happen to be the three that I wanted, but really we know it's sort of trying to circumvent the rules to find eligibility. So that again, the, the EO will then evaluate, are these in a related program of study? That's a, there's, that's a judgment call based on, on them, uh, their perspective, and, and uh, then they'll make a determination on that. The second one is bullying. Uh, Again, that's an eligibility application. Bullying, there's a, we worked with some school districts to get a very um, good definition of what they perceive bullying. The issue, we get lots of uh, questions and eligibility applications that talk on various pieces of mental health and school environment and, and these types of things, um, all of which are, are obviously serious and important, but it's very hard to, um, sort of regulate in any in any consistent way. And so what we found with this is we would go back to the school and say, you know, were you aware of this issue or that issue? And they'd say, we had no idea uh, at all. And then we'd ask the family, like, is, is you know, give us some more information and, you know, it, there's nothing there. And so it made it very difficult. So what we have asked now is that in the policy, it says it has, there's a very um, clear definition, you know, it's a repeated behavior. And most importantly is the school, the sending school, or the school the student is leaving has to have been aware of the issue, have tried to deal with the issue and felt that after, you know, an attempt by administration, counselors, teachers, et cetera, that, you know, the student just was having a tough time and, and it's time for a relocation. So the school has to be involved in that process prior to the transfer, okay? And so that's where it's important. We just don't want kids sort of using that um, as, a, as a way to sort of just jump. Now, there are some cases where um, if the kid is seeing professional help perhaps outside uh, of the school, if it's a psychologist, psychiatrist, that is sometimes considered because sometimes, you know, if it's a delicate situation, they don't want the school to necessarily be aware of it. But if it's bullying, um, there needs to be those demonstrated behaviors. The school has to be aware of it. And the school has to feel that, yeah, we are aware, we tried to do something about it, wasn't successful, probably best this kid goes somewhere else and gets a fresh start, okay? And then the last one is financial hardship. Financial hardship, again, eligibility application. This is the key here in this policy is it's an unforeseen or unexpected change in the financial situation. Uh, most commonly, this is, hey, mom or dad uh, lost their job, um, you know, my brother ended up, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it's my brother got cancer and we have to do this experimental whatever. Um, grandma, grandpa passed away and grandma had to move in with us and we had to move like those types of things where, you know, you really can't foresee these things happening. And then all of a sudden they change the financial dynamic or picture of the family. Um, and really, you know, we had one a couple of years ago, I always use an example of uh, family had a, a student in school and their older sibling they sent to university on the eastern seaboard some I don't know exactly where um, but then they flew that the the university student back seven times during the year and then they tried to say that that was a unexpected financial hardship going well the EO kind of looked at it and said well you chose to send your kid to school there and then obviously that should be a relatively expected expense for that kid to come back from time to time. Um, and so that one was denied because that's not an unexpected expense. So it, it kind of, hopefully that provides a little bit of clarity around sort of, you know, when to use those. Okay. So I'm going to pause there. I know that was a lot of information. So I've talked about the residence and then the, uh, which is a uh, change of uh, residence form. And then the, the eligibility applications for academic transfer, bullying and financial hardship. Uh, let me just pull up my list here, see who's got hands. 
I saw a hand go up, but it, maybe it's maybe I answered it because I saw it go down. So, is there any questions at this point on anything I've just covered? Okay, jump in if there is. I'm going to keep going. Um, uh, homeschool transfer submitting paperwork. I've got all that. Okay, so now those are sort of the core rules. I'm going to talk about uh, two COVID related changes for this year. And hopefully, assuming we get through this year unscathed, this will be a one and done and these these will be removed next year. The first one is six years. So every student gets five years of eligibility, as you know, as Karen mentioned, grade eight clock starts carry on. Uh, we do have a six year policy where if a student misses a significant piece of their academic experience, not just sporting, it's not usually just sort of like a minor injury, but if they admit, you know, if it's something serious and they miss part of the grade 11 or 12 year from an entire academic standpoint, uh, they can apply for a six year. That's the normal rule. Uh, and that's still in place. For this year only due to COVID, kids that are in their six year of eligibility who have not graduated and have enrolled in school and meet all the other eligibility guidelines. So they still have to be age eligible. They still have to be in the minimum number of classes, et cetera. But if they haven't graduated, um, so it can't be a choice of a kid who's basically graduated and then said, well, I might want to come back for a semester and really they're there to play football or whatever it might be. Um, but if they haven't truly graduated, they can apply for a six year, which can be granted. Okay. So that's just for this year. Uh, and then the second one is around transfers. And this is where it gets a little bit complicated. So I'll try and do my best here to um, explain it as cleanly as I can. Just bear with me for one second here. Okay. For this year only related to transfers. If a student is in grade 11 or 12 this year and they transferred to your school on or after October 1st, 2020. So last October 1st, grade 11, 12, on or after October 1st. To determine whether they have played or haven't played and what they're eligible or not eligible for, we will look at the last unaffected season of play. So we'll go back to the season of play prior to COVID to look at that and say, where, you know, what did they play? So after transfer, what are they eligible to play? couple things with that. If they are ineligible, they will still become, if they are ineligible because, let's use an example, um, I'll just use volleyball because that's the season of play we're in. Um, they transferred on November 15th of 2020 to your school, around the end of quarter one, perhaps, because um, we were quarters last year in most schools. Uh, they And they played volleyball in fall of 2019, which was the last unaffected season of play they would be ineligible at your school for volleyball until that one year mark, which will come on November 15th, at which they'd be eligible. Same thing for basketball. If you have a kid come at the semester break or quarter break in January, uh, but they played basketball in uh, winter of 2020, basically finished in March of 2020, right before the pandemic, they would be ineligible until that 12 month period. So we're gonna look back at the those kids that are grade 11 and 12 that transferred on or after October 1st at their last unaffected season of play. Uh, the rationale behind that was we started getting a lot of calls last fall, winter, when it became pretty clear that school sport likely wasn't going to come back. And there was a lot of questions asked about, well, I can just go anywhere. And so we put out, uh, you, some of you will remember, we put out a big survey to all athletic directors and principals and said, what are your thoughts on this? Because our concern was we may end up with 70,000 free agents here, which could have a pretty significant impact on competitive balance and all those other things. So um, with we got a very strong feedback that I think I want to say it was about 78, 79% of schools felt that we definitely don't want 70,000 free agents and that with some additional feedback and the board worked through it and kind of created a policy that was passed by the membership. So it wasn't the board putting in an emergency policy. The membership did approve this at the AGM. Uh, and so basically to try and keep some of the integrity around school sport, we didn't want kids using the pandemic just to sort of transfer for sport purposes. Now with that, if they are a spring season to play athlete, this will not affect them. So it's just fall and winter season. Again, the rationale behind that is those spring kids have already missed two consecutive seasons of play. We didn't want kids having to sit on a third season of play and potentially missing grade 10, 11 and 12 years. Um, so that's, that does not apply to spring season. 
And the other one is for grade for kids in grade nine and 10 this year, this also does not apply. Grade nines, obviously, they just established their homeschool on the first day of grade nine. Grade tens, they would have established their homeschool. Well, they did establish their homeschool on the first day of grade nine last year, but they weren't able to play for that school. So there's no, no participation that has been sort of recorded. And so again, you know, the board could have gone stricter on that, but trying to find that balance. Um, so grade nine and 10 students um, basically will be able to transfer this year. Uh, grade 11 and 12 will be subject to the uh, last unaffected season of play for fall and winter seasons, becoming eligible 12 months after the enrollment date. Karen, did I miss anything in that? No, I think that's uh, good. It, it is. So it's the for a grade 11 student, we'd be looking at the fall and winter of 2019 for the grade nine year. Grade 12 students, we'd be looking at the sports they played in their grade, grade 10 year in the fall and winter. Okay, so I, I know that's complicated. It's obviously it's a result of COVID. It's not ideal, um, but that is kind of the trying to find again everybody may draw their personal line somewhere different but as an organization that was kind of where the membership felt was a good spot to put that to try and prevent sort of just a free-for-all but yet still allow some i guess the other thing i'll say is if the students transferred prior to october 1st so they transferred either for the first day of school or in the first couple of weeks of school that um previous season uh, sorry, the previous unaffected season concept of looking back will not apply to them either. And though, again, you might be thinking, well, that doesn't seem consistent. We talked to, again, districts and administrators and looked at it. We know the majority of you know, school shuffling happens at the start of the year. If kids transferred in that window, they very much were likely thinking one of two things. One, uh, we'll go to, you know, we'll go through the eligibility process and there's a reason I will get my eligibility, which they would have been eligible, which then they sat out anyways. Or, to, you know, I'm transferring to the school, we're gonna file a notification of transfer. I know I'm gonna be ineligible for these, um, uh, for these sports and they ended up sitting out anyways. So either way, like it, it's a bit of an assumption, of course, because we don't know everybody's intent, but what we wanted to prevent was sort of those people that saw the writing on the wall in November, December, January, and then started making very athletically motivated transfers, which was clearly based on the information we were receiving starting to become a, a big concern. Whereas those kids that would have transferred normally for the start of the year, um, were likely expecting either to play um, based on eligibility or expecting to sit out either way, it was kind of a moot point. So that's just gives you an idea of the rationale behind sort of where that decision was made. Okay, so that's again complicated. I hope I explained it as clearly as possible. Um, is there any questions on transfers or specifically any of the COVID stuff? Jordan, I was just going to follow up and say that when we sent out our handbook in the summer, we did have a letter to athletic directors. So we did summarize this all in writing. Um, so you can refer back to that or, of course, ask us questions uh, at any time. But there was a document included in your membership package to athletic directors that went through the COVID policy adjustments for this year. Hey, I'm not seeing any hands that are jumping in and I know people are probably starting to fade here. So we're going to power through the last couple of minutes and then we'll be done. Um, I want to take this opportunity. I don't have a slide for it to remind you that um, of the concussion awareness training tool and the requirement of all coaches to complete that. So uh, this is now the, it was passed, I guess, three years ago. So this will be, would have been the third year, but we missed a year. So the second year, this is now in effect. Um, all people involved in delivering school sport, and that involves head coaches, assistant coaches, um, teacher sponsors, uh, student managers, anybody who may be listed on a game sheet or involved in uh, helping run school sport must complete the CAT tool. The CAT tool is free. Uh, it is it's the CAT is C A T T. It stands for con, uh, Concussion Awareness Training Tool. It is uh, a program that is managed by the BC Children's Hospital and the BC Injury Prevention Unit. Uh, it is one of the three approved concussion resources in Canada by Parachute Canada, uh, and so we're lucky to have it here in our backyard. We put in a policy that based on just a, a duty of care and expectation of our, our, sco our schools and parents and so forth that our coaches and those involved need to have a basic level of concussion um, 
education, being able to identify and treat them or at least start the process of treating them. Uh, and so that course is mandatory for anybody before any interaction with student athletes. So before tryouts or open gyms or anything like that, they need to have that completed. It is free. It takes about 25 to 35 minutes, depending on how fast people want to kind of get through it. Um, and when you go in there, you will put in BC School of Sports and then your school. Uh, and then what happens is uh, you get a certificate, we get notification of it. Um, and we recommend that all ADs keep their certificates handy for their or some tracking tool. Uh, the best way to say is, hey, coaches, you need to do this. And when you get the uh, certificate at the end, it's a PDF, just email it to you. And then you just throw it in a digital file somewhere and you, you just have access to them. Um, that's for all coaches in all sports. Again, free. Uh, CAT, the website is CAT Online, C A T T Online. Um, and there's, there's actually ones for medical people, for student athletes, there's other for teachers, um, and they're all, they're all there, they're free. That is good for two years. So your, your coaches have to do that every two years. They update the course three or four times a year with current research um, and sort of best case, or um, uh, what am I looking for here? The standard practice, I guess. Um, and so that is why we said every two years is just a quick refresher on that to be current, okay? And then the last section I just want to talk about is governance and uh, just really sort of, it's obviously we have a new governance structure for those of you that have been around a while and just how to work within it. Uh, so we have a board of directors still. Um, here's what they are generally responsible for. Those first four points are pretty standard. Any board of directors, whether it's corporate or non-corporate, not-for-profit, um, will have that. Uh, the last point there I want to bring out is the, sort of the rule interpreters um, and the rule enforcers, I guess, too. And so they, they often there's times where, you know, we work our best to create a policy that's clear and can kind of handle every situation. But if some situation comes that doesn't really fit that, it's their job to sort of interpret the intent of the rule and how it applies to that situation. So um, and there and also if there is sort of the uh, breaking of the policies, it's also their job to handle sort of the process in terms of discipline and, and reviewing that situation. So the rule interpreters and rule enforcers, they meet eight times a year, uh, four in person, four virtual. We actually have our first in-person meeting of the year on Monday. Uh, so there's nine members. I'm not going to go through all this in, in great detail, but there's a diversity there, small schools, big schools, rural. Um, and at the same time, we have to have at least two females and at least two admin of the nine at all times. So something for ADs, especially as you get a little bit more experience in the role. Um, it's certainly obviously not something you want to do in the first couple of years, but if it's something that you see yourself doing, it's something to be considered as getting involved with uh, committees and often that leads into BC School Sports uh, Board of Directors. Just so you have a quick snapshot, hopefully you all recognize at least one name on this list, um, but these are your board of directors this year. So Rick Thiessen is the president, um, and then the rest are, are all members of the board. The Legislative Assembly, again, I'm going through this quickly. Hopefully some of this is familiar or, or at least you're coming back to you. The Legislative Assembly is now the decision-making body. So they will make uh, and approve any changes to the handbook. So um, eligibility policies, kind of procedural administrative policies, uh, sports-specific regulations. I hope you all notice in your handbook that um, for the first time we have all the sport regulations in the handbook, uh, at the back of the handbook, and all of those are there. So in terms of you know, um, birthing, uh, championship structure, rules or modifications, et cetera. That's all there. And we'll kind of get that to be better and better as we go on and get more information. But hopefully that's an asset for you as, as AD is not having to search for it in a bunch of different spots. So again, Legislative Assembly, they're the rulemaking body. They meet twice a year, once in the fall, once in the spring. Uh, and that's when changes to policy uh, can be made. I will say the board does have the ability to make emergency policy. They try not to use it very often. And if they do, obviously it's communicated out uh, whenever that happens. Legislative Assembly is 53 members, 27 of those are zone reps. So generally those are ADs, um, one of which is an admin. Our committee chairs are partner orgs, which are principals association, uh, parent advisory council association, um, some governments, um, indigenous sports, um, physical activity, I Spark Indigenous Sport Physical Activity and Recreation Council uh, and our board members, et cetera. So that's where those 53 members come from. Uh, how do you sort of bring change forward in this new structure? Uh, you can do it through your zone. 
Um, so you can bring as a, as a member school, bring stuff up to your zone and say, hey, you know, discuss it with your zone. And if your zone is, is in support of, they can then bring it forward for discussion for the legislative assembly. If it's technical around a sport or championship, usually we'll go through a committee. Uh, so we've got committees that look both at championships and the sport rules. So through the appropriate committee, or you can actually bring it through us here and we would bring it through the board uh, and do it that way. So there's, there's lots of opportunities. Um, it's always a good idea if, you're, if you have an idea or a thought to give us a call and just say, hey, like, have you thought about this? And we'll say, hey, that's a great idea. We haven't, here's how we can maybe look at that. Or in some cases, you know, we've explored it um, or there's other reasons why it may or may not be a, a great idea, but but um, certainly give us a call and, and we can sort of walk through that um, and go from there. Okay. And then the last piece of this is championships. Uh, this is the last slide. We're almost there. Uh, two types of championships. Uh, and these again are, are your championships. It's important that we recognize that like, this is the biggest celebration of school sport we have. And it's important that our member schools sort of take on um, that. When you think about it, we've got roughly 40 events every year. And we've got over 400 schools. Um, so, you know, ideally, if every school decided to try and host one championship every five to 10 years, we would never have a problem with this. Uh, it's a really good, it's a really cool experience to host a championship in your school. Um, and, and I know uh, I was lucky enough to, to win a, a provincial championship coaching um, in our own gym. Um, and the experience for those student athletes was something that they'll never forget. And so, you know, often we say, hey, if you've got a, if you've got a good grade nine or 10 team coming along, like you're three years out, but you should start thinking about, hmm, like maybe that's a good idea for that. So most of our events are school hosted. There are some neutral site events like, you know, basketball or rugby that need bigger venues. Um, but there was a document that was put out and I, I will go to it very briefly here um, that kind of says, you know, here's where, you know what, I won't go to it because we're over time and I'm going to wrap up, but you would have received it. It's also on our news page and in the newsletter um, that lists the championships that are available. Some of them have since been filled, the, the urgent ones, but there's still lots of championships and the way this, the structure will work in the news, in the news um, way this process will work in the new structure is it's roughly 18 months ahead of the championship that that bid will be due and be evaluated by the legislative assembly. So if you're looking, so for this legislative assembly meeting coming up in November, they'll be looking at the spring 2023 championships, which I know for a lot of ADs, you know, trying to get your heads wrapped around tomorrow, you know, how do I think about 2023, but it's actually not that far away. And what it really does is gives us the appropriate time to support you in planning the event. Um, we, we have a much more hands-on role. We have a lot of more resources uh, that make it a lot easier for you as a school to host the event. Um, there is revenue sharing opportunities uh, in a lot of events. So it's a way for you potentially to make some money if that's of interest to some schools. Um, so it is something I, I urge you to consider. Again, it's all of our responsibilities as schools to make sure we, we host these championships and do it well. And we're here to support that. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, and then obviously, so spring of 2023 will be looked at um, this fall. And then next spring, when we have our AGM, that is when the fall and winter of 23 into 24 will be looked at. So again, I understand right now that's difficult to sort of look ahead and understand, but I really um, just be aware of how that's how that process will work. And if you have a good cohort of kids in a sport, um, perhaps talk to your coach and your admin about what do you think about this? I know it's two years away, but start to kind of get that thinking and, and then we're there to support you if you get awarded that championship. So with that, I'm gonna stop the share. And I see one question here in the chat. If there's any other questions, let's just see. Um, yeah, so Lily, just uh, to your question, sorry, it was a direct message to so people who probably didn't see it. Uh, anybody on the bench um, for a game that's not a participant, not a player, has to have the concussion training. So, head coach, assistant coach, uh, teacher sponsor, student manager, anybody who. And really the thinking behind that is if you're on the bench, sometimes a coach doesn't see everything that's happening and maybe there's a, a contact here and then you notice a kid might not be doing well. So we want those, we want everybody who might be there to be trained and being able to identify potentially problematic situations. So the expectation is everybody should have that. It's actually not a bad idea for you to have your student athletes do it as well, but that's not required. But anybody else who is involved needs to complete that uh, CAT training. Oh, my camera's off. Sorry, I'm just you're sitting here looking at nobody and I didn't realize that. My apologies. Um, is there any other questions before we say farewell? Okay. 
hopefully this has been beneficial. Um, thanks, Wendy. I'm glad you uh, uh, appreciated the time. Um, if you, you know, really here at BC School Sports, we are here to support you as our member schools. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we've got a great team here, whether it's sport related, whether it's, you know, just getting kids in the system and administrative, whether it's bigger, you know, policy type things. We are here to, to help you out, discuss these things. So um, don't hesitate to reach out, whether it's email or phone, and, and we look forward to speaking with you all. I hope you have a great year. And uh, again, I'm sure we'll talk to you all very soon. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you.